More on our top story. Within the next two years, progressive wages will cover most lower wage resident workers in Singapore. Senior Minister of State for Manpower Zaki Mohammad spoke to my colleague Glenda Chong. He started by explaining how new sectors under the progressive wage model were chosen. So if you look at the progressive wage model, one thing we decided at the outset of this tripartite work group was to go on the basis that we want to build an inclusive Singapore. I think that's very important. So one of the things that we looked at, three things. One is to make sure that there's progression for our workers. Two, there's dynamism in the sectors. So therefore, the business can grow and therefore businesses can also transform and pay our workers better. So it's not just, as, as you mentioned, you know, it's not just about worker wages going up, but productivity is important too for not just the worker, but the business and the sector. And lastly, solidarity. So these are also sectors where you also want to ensure, right, you have certain buy-in, not just from the employers, but as you expand, you realise that the early sectors that we had in PWM, the cleaning, landscape security, were all B2B. Mm. And as you move into food and beverage, retail, you're going to start to move into very consumer-centric sectors. And that's where uh, we talk about solidarity, inclusiveness, and that's where we've got to need the buy-in of the people too. So therefore, that, that, that's a slight shift that you start to see. Um, so as you expand progressive wages, now we're going to cover 234,000 workers, up to 8 in 10 wage workers being covered. Um, what that means is that you, you will have to move into consumer space. Um, so that's, that's a big shift. The second thing that we are doing to your question of whether we're going to bring it closer to median. So that is a principle in which we have put in place and what we call the median plus. So median plus basically means you look at wage growth. It's what the median is, uh, what, what kind of wage growth the median incomes are having and you plus so that you can bridge that gap. Mm. So that is the principle. So if you look at some of the uh, recent moves, say for the cleaning landscape and even lift and escalator, you find the wage growth have been far greater than what we've had in the last five years. So we've had good progress, 30% growth in the last five years. But you can see by 2028, sectors like cleaning and landscape will almost double from 1,000 to 2,004 today to about 2,004. Mm -hmm. you know, and lift and escalator move up to almost $3,000 per month. So you would not have imagined you know, these being blue-collar jobs because they're already quite close to white-collar um, jobs. And that's where we talk about inclusiveness. You want to bring the low wage workers closer to media, and that's our goal. So the businesses have been, have been quite supportive. I know times are difficult, challenging. Um, we spent the last 10 months talking to industry associations to see how this is possible. And for those that we've selected, um, you talk to associations, they they're now thinking really hard of how you can... Uh, transform businesses, look at you know, improving the sectors, and government provides a lot of support in terms of helping business automate, uh, look at new business models, transform, so that we can also create new jobs, work out new job roles. So cleaning now, beyond just doing the regular cleaning, they're doing sanitization, hygiene, and even facilities management for some. So these are areas in which businesses are also transforming to cope, to be more productive, and hopefully you, know, you can get better jobs and careers out of these. Yep. Okay, Minister, I want to talk about what you mentioned just now about the buy-in. Yes. So if you look at the timeline for the rollout, it's shorter than those of earlier implementations. Can employers actually bear the cost? Are mm. they going to get any support? So in fact, the beauty of the progressive wage approach that we have is that it's tripartite tri consensus. So it's really about negotiating with the employers, see what's bearable, how far the market can bear. And um, in this case, um, you know, in terms of uh, coming out, come, doing this right through the pandemic right now as we are doing recovery, I think this is where Prime Minister also spoke about transition support. And that's where government is strongly um, studying how we can enable companies and support them through this period so that we can implement this well, um, buffer some of the impacts from the pandemic at the same time as well, you know, help our workers get more salaries. So it's not been easy if you talk to anyone from F&B and retail today. But um, I'm quite heartened that you know, they are on board in terms of commitment to say that, OK, this is something that we will do. It's for the benefit of our workers. And we've had good learnings, best practices from the earlier PWMs. Mm. So therefore, we spent a bit of time learning. Um, now that you know, they can run, we are taking some of these learnings back into these sectors and say, you know what, what we've seen in cleaning and security, for example, after we've had improvements to wages, we also worked out how they can uh, improve work conditions and work hours for security, you now see OTs reduced, but salaries go up. <laughs> so you, you see that, but a lot of it is resulting, of, resulting from productivity. And uh, as a result, you find more locals joining the sector. So when retail like FMB see this, they say, OK, la, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit more bearable. We have learned to manage the, downs, the downside risks. And therefore, I think there's a lot more confidence today that uh, we can manage this better than, let's say, our learning period in the early years.
Okay, but let's look at the firms with um, foreign employees because they will have to pay, I'm looking at the numbers here, local workers a qualifying salary of at least $1,400. So isn't this then the minimum wage some have been asking for? I mean, if they have to pay this minimum, um, at the qualifying salary of at least $1,400? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> so actually, if you look at the LQS, or what we call the local qualifying salary, it's not a new scheme. It's been around since, 2000, since before 2007, so you've had about 14, 15 year run in. And um, employers have been paying LQS for access to foreign workers for two reasons. One, was you want to, if you want to have Singaporeans right, to meet your DRC quota, it's important that we ensure that they're not paid token salaries, like, you know, just pay low salaries so that I can just get the quota to get a foreign worker. Two, because you also have um, cheaper labour um, access right, to foreign workers. Therefore, there's also importance that we uh, sustain and we ensure that we protect the Singaporean worker so that their wage is not depressed. So that's so important. So this was the reason why LQS was there. So, the, the, so today what we are doing is that actually you look at the LQS today, most firms are already paying LQS, most of our low-wage workers are also already being paid LQS. So it's just covering that last gap. So employers already know that actually if you talk to employers today, many find the access to foreign workers tight because they have difficulty finding Singaporeans, you hear that too. But it also means that the Singaporeans that are hiring today are already being paid LQS because they're counted towards DRC. Okay. So actually a large majority of them are already being paid LQS. What you're doing is just covering the gap. So to them, I think what's important now is the signaling. Right? It's the signaling. Um, but why is it not a, uh, different from a minimum wage that your question that you're asking? Is that because it doesn't cover all firms. It's not a blunt minimum wage tool that cuts across all. So it's only for firms that hire foreign workers. Right? So technically, what you're doing is that because you have, you're collectively, you have access to foreign workers, cheaper foreign sources of labour. So therefore, I think you should pay Singaporeans, but then you should you know, make sure that our Singaporeans are protected in that space, uh, salary-wise. Um, the second thing is that the... Um, this LQS only applies to local workers, Singaporean workers, in many minimum wage uh, legal frameworks around the world, legislations. You find that they actually cover both local and foreign workers because your international labour conventions require you to. You mm. cannot discriminate between local and foreign workers. So therefore, this enables us to be a bit smart about it, go a bit around to say, if you're hiring foreign workers, you pay local workers LQS salary. So one, it is not a new scheme. But it, so therefore, I have to assure employers lah, to a certain sense that you know, they are very familiar with this. And they know that government adjusts it from time to time, bearing in mind the cost implications. And um, really, you know, it's also meant to protect our local workers so that there's no wage depression when you are in an environment with many cheaper you know, foreign, foreign, foreign workforce.